uh, this morning, we're we're very lucky uh, and to have uh, Gerhard Huskin from Tübingen, uh, who will talk to us about space time versions of inverse mean curvature flow. Please. Great. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everybody. Just remind me, what's the usual uh, length? 50 minutes or 60 minutes? It's around 50 to 55 minutes, depending on how much time you want for questions. Okay, fine. Great. Um, so I want to talk to you about space-time versions of inverse mean curvature flow. Oops. Yes. And um, let's start with the setup. So being a general relativity conference, I try to make the setup rather short. Um, I'm going to look at asymptotically flat initial data sets, M3 with a metric G and a bilinear form K. And um, I assume it's um, complete, non-compact um, with just one end. In fact, we will only look at the exterior region of one end. And I'm not assuming the constraint equations uh, throughout the lecture, although at some part I will assume that the trace of K is equal to zero or satisfies a sign. And then in three dimensions, you would um, assume some asymptotically flat uh, decay conditions on the metric and on the second fundamental form. Um, similar conditions uh, would uh, hold if uh, we go to higher dimensions. Then inside the three manifold, we will look at hypersurfaces. And uh, the notation there is that if I write nu, I mean the outer unit normal of the hypersurface. Um, there's an induced metric on each hypersurface coming from the three manifold. Um, H is the corresponding mean curvature. In Euclidean space, the mean curvature of a sphere would be positive. And um, the other quantity that's going to be important is the two trace of the second fundamental form, so the trace along the surface, which also in higher dimensions has a natural generalization. And then uh, important quantities from a physical point of view are the future and past expansions of sigma, so that's h plus p or h minus p, and uh, it has the interpretation of um, the first variation of area in the two null directions if the uh, initial data set sits in a Lorentzian manifold. And um, since we want to stress this uh, Lorentzian point of view, another important quantity is going to be the norm, the space-time norm if the, of the mean curvature vector if, um, we, if this two surface happens to sit in a three manifold in a Lorentzian manifold, then the script H is going to be the norm of this, uh, uh, um, of this uh, co-dimension two surface in Lorentzian space. And uh, we would only look at the case where this is a space-like surface, so this is a positive uh, quantity. Then uh, well-known notations are that these are, uh, we call sigma marginally outer inner trapped surface if uh, one of these quantities, theta plus or minus is zero. And, uh, in the lecture, we will also have um, surfaces um, where we have generalized the parent horizon, in other words, where uh, just h squared is equal to p squared. Okay, now the general idea is I want to look at um, sweep outs of such uh, three manifolds or of the exterior region of such uh, three manifolds. So here's sort of a schematic picture and there's many sweep outs have been studied in the literature. There's been the constant mean curvature foliations. Here I have drawn a picture where uh, a sweep out is established by mean curvature flow where we come from some huge coordinate sphere, for example, and let it flow by mean curvature flow and it sweeps out the three manifold until um, the pieces uh, contract to a point, say on the left hand side of the picture or um, converge to a minimal surface in this sex setting here uh, on the right hand side of the picture. Um, so there's many different such flows, but in this lecture I want to look at uh, 
sort of inverse flows that go the other direction from mean curvature flow. We go from inside outward. And uh, let me remind you the um, prototype of such flows is the inverse mean curvature flow just on a Riemannian three manifold. So this is well defined without taking the data K into account. And it just says that if you have a, in the smooth setting, a surface with positive mean curvature, then you want to solve uh, that the time derivative of the position vector is equal to <clears throat> the normal uh, in the outer direction with the speed one over H. Now, uh, this is exactly the opposite direction to mean curvature flow, um, but it's also sort of the inverse of the speed. So these two minus signs cancel out when you look at the linearization to make this again a, a parabolic system. It's a nonlinear parabolic system as long as H is positive. Uh, you get short time existence and so on. And eventually this flow led to the proof of the Penrose inequality in this Riemannian setting um, for a single outermost uh, component of the horizon, provided the scalar curvature is greater or equal to zero. This was a result with Tom Ilman in, in 2001. The difficulty of course was <clears throat> that the flu the smooth flow, which already had been suggested by uh, Garrosh and had been studied by Yang, uh, that this smooth flow uh, is not always there. It, there will be general singularities and you have to find a concept of weak solutions. And the weak solutions <coughs> were um, constructed with a, a level set approach where you write the surface as the boundary of the um, subset of the uh, time arrival function u. And then when you consider that the flow of such a level set always has the speed one over the mod of the gradient. And since the speed is one over the mean curvature, then you can sort of turn it around and say that the gradient of the level set function should be equal to the inverse of the speed, which is the mean curvature and the mean curvature of a level set is the divergence of the unit normal, which is gradient u divided by mod gradient u. So in the smooth setting, this uh, level set reformulation takes this kind of uh, equation. Um, of course, the equation, even if mod du is positive, this is a degenerate elliptic boundary value problem. Uh, you cannot turn a parabolic problem into an elliptic problem. It's degenerate in the uh, speed direction of the flow. Um, uh, but a major difficulty is, of course, that the gradient of u might be zero, and then you have to make sense of this equation. Now, the approach with uh, Tom Ilman was uh, to bring in a variation of principle, and the key idea was that you treat the right-hand side of this previous equation, you treat that as a bulk term. You see the left-hand side clearly comes from a variational principle, but the right-hand side does not. So we just sort of um, cheat or keep it as a bulk term and put it like that into the equation, which makes the functional dependent on u. Um, but this gives you a sort of variational principle with respect to u itself. It's more like a, a stability property uh, for solutions. Um, rather than sort of a direct variation of principle. Anyway, this idea of looking at this functional, this leads to a, weak, uh, a concept of weak solutions, which um, then uh, has a monotone quantity, the Hawking mass, and that leads to the proof of the Penrose inequality. But uh, people want to have, of course, sort of a Penrose inequality also in the setting where you have the data K around. So that has led to all sorts of attempts uh, to use some kind of inverse mean curvature flow or version of inverse mean curvature flow in the um, uh, Lorentzian setting where we have both the metric and the data k. Um, one of the first attempts there was by uh, Jörg Fraundiner in uh, 2001. He published a paper where he said, okay, <clears throat> 
let's just do inverse mean curvature flow in a Lorentzian manifold. So if you have a space-like uh, initial two-dimensional sphere in a Lorentzian four manifold, uh, such that the um, norm of the um, uh, mean curvature vector is positive, then let's just go in direction of the mean curvature vector. Actually, minus sign is missing here. It should go in the opposite direction of the mean curvature vector. There's a minus sign missing in the formula. Um, divided, and there's a square miss, sorry. Um, there's two typos there. It's a minus h, and in the denominator, it's an, a script h squared, so that it agrees with inverse mean curvature flow in case we are in a time symmetric setting. So um, Fraundiner showed that under this flow, if you have a solution and you have the dominant energy condition in the Lorentzian manifold, then the Hawking mass is monotone. And then you could again prove, um, uh, possibly prove a Penrose inequality. The problem is that this flow is not uh, parabolic because it's two co-dimensions and it turns out in sort of in the space-like direction, it is still uh, parabolic, but in the time direction, it's anti-parabolic. So uh, there is no existence theory for it. You would have to sort of prescribe initial data in one direction and end data in the other direction. Nobody really knows how to solve this. Um, there have been attempts in this direction um, which I don't want to go into, but I want to mention that Bray, Hayward, Mars, Walter in 2007, and then also Bray and Curry in 2011 made some very interesting suggestions um, how to possibly construct flows. What I want to concentrate on is sort of a setting in the three-dimensional initial data set, which in some sense takes into account the data K, tries to change the uh, inverse mean curvature flow by adding a term um, involving the second fundamental form K. The first uh, attempt there was a <clears throat> by Kristen Moore, PhD student of mine in 2014. So she looked at initial data in such an initial data set. She made to make a technical assumption that the trace of K is greater or equal to zero. And then she solved the equation ddf by dt so the speed is equal to um, normal direction with speed one over h plus p now you could just as well of course take the speed um, one over h minus p in that case you would have to assume trace of k is less or equal to zero and the idea is that so instead of the inverse mean curvature, you take one of the null mean curvatures and uh, take that as the inverse speed. Now, um, when you then try to solve this and follow the ideas of um, my paper with Ilmanen, then you are led to, again, a, a degenerate elliptic equation where you now have to um, incorporate the term P. And uh, the term P was, as I said, the tube trace. So you have to take the, um, when taking the trace of the second fundamental form, you'd have to take away the normal direction. The normal direction is in direction of uh, DIU over mod DU. So this uh, <coughs> uh, explains the, uh, second term on the right hand side. And uh, this is all fine if uh, you are in a regular setting where mod du is non zero. But as we know, inverse mean curvature flow has jumps. So we expect this flow also to have jumps. So when constructing the weak solution, um, we will have whole regions where mod du is equal to zero. And then it's not clear how you can even make sense of the second term on the right-hand side. Um, it's, the anis it's an anisotropic term. Um, and uh, how do you make sense of that in the jump region if 
du is equal to zero. Somehow the information on the anisotropy seems to be completely lost if you have jumps in the uh, time function u. Now, the beautiful idea of Kristen Moore in, in her thesis was um, to add a dimension and um, approach this uh, problem by replacing this uh, term involving the gradient that we have in this equation. Remember, di u over mod du is the normal component of the is a, is the ith component of the normal uh, vector to the hypersurface. So she adds this into the bulk term by looking at a general vector field of length one nu i, and writes a functional that depends um, on the uh, as a bulk term both on the function u and on the normal vector field nu. And now the idea is that instead of working downstairs where you have these regions where um, the gradient is zero and you don't know how to find nu at first, um, you recall that the solution is constructed anyway by adding a dimension and by looking at graphs of functions in M3 cross R and in the elliptic regularization process, these graphs will always exist. They might turn into vertical cylinders, but the normal vector field will always be there. So when you add this dimension, this you can make sense of the normal vector field very well upstairs. You may not make sense of it downstairs, but upstairs you have this vector field. And therefore the idea is to look at this variational principle in terms of pairs, a function and a vector field nu, and use this functional upstairs in the product of M3 and R in order to formulate a variational principle that defines a weak solution. She was <coughs> successful in doing that. And uh, I now want to come to the um, flow that I've studied recently with Markus Wolf in Tübingen, um, where we believe we have a flow that is even better than the one that Kristen Moore studied. And we try to apply Kristen Moore's approach to deal with the anisotropy in this uh, new flow. Now, uh, what's the setup? So again, we have this initial data set, M3, G, and K. Uh, and we have an initial hypersurface sitting in there. Uh, assume again, it has positive mean curvature. And uh, in fact, assume that square root of H squared minus P squared is greater or equal to zero. And in the smooth setting, we would like to solve um, the flow in normal direction outwards with inverse speed, uh, with speed given by the inverse of the norm of the um, mean curvature vector in space time, if you like. Now, of course, you can just write down this formula, but the interpretation, of course, is that we use this quantity that has Lorentz variance in, in order to get some better properties. <coughs> now, when you try to solve uh, this flow, then by solving for H, <coughs> notice that in the level set approach, uh, mod, do, mod du uh, would um, correspond to square root of h squared minus p squared. <coughs> and then if you solve this for h, you get uh, on the left hand side, again, the mean curvature of the level set. And on the right hand side, you get this quite nonlinear expression, which of course agrees again with usual inverse mean curvature flow in case kij is not there. But it's somewhat more nonlinear than in the case um, of uh, Kristen Moore. On the other hand, um, you have sort of automatically the mean curvature positive in this setting. 
So it may have some uh, good extra uh, technical properties. Um, the main motivation for us <clears throat> to study this um, space in inverse space timing curvature flow um, is, as I said, that this quantity script H is Lorentz invariant and has this interpretation in space time. But then also there was this <clears throat> paper by uh, Kala Zederbaum and Anna Sakovic in 2018, where they looked at uh, in foliations near infinity of asymptotically flat <clears throat> initial data sets, their script age is constant. And they showed that these foliations near infinity have nicer properties than, for example, constant mean curvature foliations. In particular, these foliations have a certain uh, space time invariance, and you can prove their existence. Um, they show that they can uh, prove existence under sort of um, very, very weak um, decay conditions on both the metric <clears throat> and the second fundamental form. So it seems to be the infinity somehow the nicest possible <clears throat> foliation that you can create by playing with mean curvature <clears throat> and this uh, two trace of the second fundamental form. So the hope is that near infinity, we expect that this inverse space time mean curvature flow is uh, better than <clears throat> say mean curvature flow, inverse mean curvature flow or null inverse mean curvature flow studied by Christian Moon. Okay, <clears throat> so in the first step, Markus Wolf and I looked at the smooth flow. To, because when you do elliptic regularization later, we will need properties of the smooth flow. So in order to study the properties of smooth inverse space-time mean curvature flow, you have to uh, first do the usual work and establish evolution equations for all interesting quantities. And uh, let me go through some of them here. The little gamma ij, that's the induced metric on the two surface. And uh, the h lower ij is the second fundamental form. Um, and uh, when you look at these equations, um, you see that um, somehow the Laplacian will come in because DDT of H is gonna be the Laplacian of the speed. Uh, it's just the Jacobi operator as it should be on the right-hand side. Um, the thing that makes everything nasty is the la very last term in the last uh, equation uh, because to study everything, to study how the speed changes, you also have to take a time derivative of this anisotropy term of this P. And uh, this time derivative involves the first derivative of the speed, which is the first derivative in, of, in particular of the mean curvature. So you have sort of a nasty term um, to estimate when you try to control the speed. So that's the structure of these equations. And uh, the worst term here is the last term and the uh, last equation. Nevertheless, we can prove the following theorem uh, for the smooth case. In other words, if you have smooth initial data and you have a lower bound on uh, the denominator, or, which is a lower bound on uh, square root of h squared minus p squared, in inverse mean curvature flow, this would correspond to a lower bound on H. Then you have a definite short time interval. T depends on the data and <clears throat> a unique smooth solution uh, on that time interval. And you have something which is wrong for many other flows like mean curvature flow. Um, it's a result that I proved uh, with uh, Tom Ilman in in the uh, Euclidean case for inverse mean curvature flow, namely that if the speed is bounded, then the res solution remains regular. If you have a lower bound on this quantity, which is, means that you have an upper bound on the speed, then you can extend the solution. And uh, in particular, you can characterize the maximal time interval of existence of smooth solutions 
by just recognizing this that the speed must become unbounded as t approaches the finite time. Um, this result is even new for inverse mean curvature flow in a general uh, Riemannian manifold. <clears throat> the difficulty <clears throat> is to deal with this bad term that I just mentioned. Uh, you have to set up a, a tensor maximum principle for the second fundamental form. First, get an upper bound on the largest eigenvalue of the second fundamental form because of positive mean curvature, this implies a lower bound on all eigenvalues of the second fundamental form as well and gives you a bound on the curvature. Once you have a bound on the curvature, you can use um, regularity theory of kurloff safonov for fully nonlinear equations to conclude that the solution has to remain completely smooth. But in getting this tensor maximum principle to work for the largest eigenvalue, uh, you have to somehow uh, control the first derivatives of the mean curvature that appear on the right-hand side when you try to do these evolution equations. So it's sort of a um, rather technical estimate, but in the end it works out and you have sort of this nice parabolic property for the smooth version of the flow. Now, it turns out you have to do a little bit better with these estimates. Um, huh? Yeah. Namely, this upper bound on the mean curvature, which gives you sort of the um, uh, extendability once uh, you have um, the um, mean curvature also bounded from below. Uh, this upper bound can be improved. Of course, not the lower bound on the mean curvature, but the upper bound can be improved. You can make it into an interior estimate. And uh, maybe I point out where this technically comes from by going back a few slides. Oops. Here. When you look at the evolution equation of the mean curvature, that's the fourth equation, you see one term on the right-hand side, minus psi, that's the speed, which might get um, very large, so it's a very bad term, uh, but it has a minus sign, and in the bracket you have the square of the second fundamental form. So this is a strong negative term uh, pushing h down. And you can use this negative term on the right-hand side of the evolution equation of H in order to control the bad terms that come from the evolution of, um, of P um, and somehow combine things such that you get an interior estimate on the inverse of the speed on the square root of H squared minus P squared. And uh, on the right-hand side, you only get things coming in that are either bounded in terms of the initial hypersurface, sigma zero, or in terms of um, the data, the second fundamental form, and maybe the derivative of the second fundamental form, K. Of course, it's enough to take the soup norm in the ball of radius R, not on the whole manifold. And this will make the uh, estimate, in fact, scaling invariant, and it turns out uh, that this is a crucial estimate that we will need in the construction of the weak solutions. Um, that estimate was known for inverse mean curvature flow. Here, the, the work is to um, handle the bad terms coming from the anisotropy P. P. Now, how to construct weak solutions. I mentioned already that we want to use elliptic regularization. So- uh, Gerhard, idea... sorry, I, I just have a, a question about the, the flow, sorry. Yes. Um, so the, the existence theorem said that it was, uh, you start with immersed data. If you start with embedded data, does the flow preserve embeddedness? No, I don't think so. There's no reason. Okay. Because it's an out, it's yeah. an outward flow. But does does regular inverse mean curvature flow preserve embeddedness? Uh, 
No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it in there's no reason because you could um, if if you think think of sort of a, a sausage, a leberwurst, uh, where we are sort of yeah. the two ends are almost touching, then clearly it will immediately intersect. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess you can make that mean convex. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, you can so def definitely make yeah. that mean convex. Right. So, so then my other question is so, how do you know that phi, I think maybe you said this, but how do you know that phi is not becoming zero? Also, um, how, yeah, the speed. How do you, how do you how do you bound the speed from below? Oh, the well, that's the that's the initial assumption that I have. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but right. So, how, and, so and does the theorem, delta the theorem not only propagate? says the theorem says that you can only extend you can exactly extend the solution as long as this doesn't happen. That's what the theorem oh, says. Oh, from below. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay, I understand. Okay, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's. I mean, you you got it yes. exactly right. The, the, yes. the problem is feed okay. going yes, to zero. Yes, I understand. Yeah, thanks. And as long as that doesn't happen, the flow is completely smooth. Cool. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now this other estimate goes the other direction. So I, I'm not attempting to get a lower bound on fee. I'm just saying the upper bound, which is not so surprising actually. But the upper bound can be made into an interior estimate, which is scaling invariant. Okay, it's a completely interior estimate um, that you can uh, apply anywhere where you have a solution. Yeah. Okay. So then, okay, I, I hadn't thought about this embeddedness. I thought I thought in my mind actually that embeddedness would be true. So when when you then write these time of arrival functions for non-embedded things. Geometrically, that doesn't make so much sense, right? Because the flow is not monotone in some sense. Right. So, so, so we have to get exact. We have to find a way. Uh, I mean, I want to start with something embedded, and I want to deal exactly with this problem that these things. Yeah. I mean, the the, the, the sausage thing is exactly the enemy. Uh -huh. So I want to find a concept of solution where. Uh, this um, where something can overcome this difficulty. So the solution, the weak solution we want to construct um, in the level set approach uh, would jump to something uh, surrounding the two ends of the sausage, um, essentially make it make it sort of the, the, make the the sausage that is uh, diffeomorphic to, uh, S2, make it into a sausage which is uh, diffeomorphic to S1 cross S1. Yeah, they would, they would like okay. to jump <clears throat> and, and sort of um, bridge this gap by keeping the mean curvature positive. Okay, and then how to achieve this? To okay. achieve Thank this, you. the idea is to, to use uh, elliptic regularization in the level set approach. So we add an epsilon wherever there is a danger that the gradient goes to zero, an epsilon squared. And then this turns it for each positive epsilon into a quasi-linear, the left-hand side is quasi-linear operator, quasi-linear elliptic equation <clears throat> with a um, nonlinear and unisotropic right-hand side. And uh, <clears throat> this is exactly the approach for inverse mean curvature flow. And we start with this time of arrival function, of course, with um, zero on um, the initial data. And we actually have to use finite domains. So it will be huge domain, say of size epsilon to the minus one, but it has to be a finite domi domain because the right-hand side is now bounded below by epsilon. And you cannot solve such an equation as uh, with this left-hand side on an arbitrarily large domain. domain. There, there has to be, you have, so you have to also impose outer boundary conditions, which I'm not gonna get into. The point is that this epsilon regularization is not just a technical tool. The deep point here is that it has a geometric interpretation. 
So it's, it's a natural thing technically to do to add, add this epsilon squared to make it elliptic, but it has a geometric interpretation, namely on the left-hand side, if you rescale by a factor epsilon to the minus one, then the epsilon goes completely away on the left-hand side and turns into one. And then the left-hand side just becomes the mean curvature of the rescaled graph of one over epsilon u epsilon. So it's the mean curvature of this rescaled u epsilon. And on the right-hand side, you get something which looks like epsilon times, and then you get sort of square root of one plus the u square and these other things. And when, when you work it out, it turns out uh, that you have a solution of the old equation, a smooth solution of the old equation, which is just translating downwards in the product M3 cross R with speed one over epsilon. In other words, the epsilon trick is not just giving you a, a equation that you can treat with elliptic theory. It is also turning your um, level set approach for solutions with some singularities into the old smooth equation of, in, of this inverse mean curvature flow. In other words, but, but you pay for that by adding one dimension. Right, you have sort of, you've, you, the gain you have is that from this complicated thing downstairs, you get now a beautiful scalar equation, but it's one dimension higher. And the gain is of course, that on this solution upstairs, I can apply the interior estimates that I've just established in the previous slide. Right, the, we had this bound on uh, H. So th this means upstairs, since H is the left-hand side, look on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have mod du. So this bound on the left-hand side that we get for smooth solutions immediately turns into a gradient bound for u epsilon. So the previous estimate um, for the smooth flow can be applied to the epsilon regularization to give uh, uniform C1 estimates everywhere. And in fact, they scale, right? You can even see that uh, the gradient uh, has to go down like one on R as, R, as, as the radius uh, goes, radius R goes to infinity. So you get a very strong uniform gradient estimate, uniform in epsilon. So you already know from that, that as epsilon tends to zero, you will get um, a subsequence that converges uh, uniformly to a Lipschitz function. So the, <clears throat> that's what this interior estimate on the inverse speed was good for. Okay, now to get a concept of weak solution, however, we need to use a variational principle again. And <clears throat> now we follow the ideas of uh, Kristen Moore and uh, define a bulk term P depending on the vector field nu. So for each nu, for each vector field nu, we def define P of nu as the uh, trace of Kij um, with respect to the direction nu. And <clears throat> then we look at the corresponding um, functional, which now instead of just depending on a function u as an inverse mean curvature flow in this anisotropic version of inverse mean curvature flow, it also depends on the direction. And <clears throat> I want to essentially then apply the same concept um, uh, that we had in inverse mean curvature flow now to this. Uh, let me formulate it out again. So we look at this rescaled u epsilon from the, the we know that that is a solution a smooth solution of inverse mean curvature flow upstairs. So these sigma epsilon hat, these are smooth solutions of our flow of the upstairs. And so we know they satisfy a variational principle and they have a, for each positive epsilon, they have a 
very nice, well-defined uh, normal vector field. And then we use the functional upstairs using these general vector fields nu and prove that our epsilon solutions uh, that we can pass the variational principle from the epsilon solutions to a limit upstairs as epsilon tends to zero, giving us a limiting function u. That's the easy part because of this gradient bound on u, that there's going to be a limit u. But we can use geometric measure theory to also show that we get some limit of these vector fields uh, nu hat epsilon upstairs and pass them to a limit nu hat such that the um, uh, variational principle sort of has the appropriate lower semi continuity properties. So that's the main idea to do everything upstairs in the space with one added dimension in order to deal uh, to, to make sense of this anisotropy that sort of upstairs, even in those regions where we're going to have jumps, that the gradient of little u is going to be zero in the end. Um, and um, the vector field downstairs does not survive. The vector field upstairs uh, is going to the, the normal vector field to the graph of the sigma hat epsilon t is going to survive if epsilon tends to zero and give us a vector field nu hat, which is actually going to be in C0 alpha. Now, because of that, our actual definition of weak solutions has to be, uh, by construction, somewhat com complicated. So the solution is now going to be a pair, a pair of a function upstairs, capital U, and a vector field nu upstairs is a weak solution with respect to some initial condition. Um, if U is a Lipschitz function, nu is measurable, and if we have the translation invariant, remember these were translating solutions, so we want the limit also be to translation invariant in the vertical direction. And uh, we need the boundary uh, condition to be attained, so we need the limit function u on the boundary of a zero to be zero. We need the positivity and um, we need inside the initial condition e zero, we need u negative. And we then most importantly is property two. Um, we want the sub level sets to minimize the functional um, in uh, the region upstairs. The, the key factor here is the, that everything is cross R and we want to minimize it for each positive T. And uh, now there are some more conditions, but the key point is that in the jump regions, actually uh, we get uh, very smooth solutions upstairs. We still get the level sets upstairs in the jump regions, and there are nice C1 alpha hypersurfaces, and they have therefore nice uh, C0 alpha uh, uh, normal vector fields, and they um, are uh, boundaries of uh, Kapchopoli sets upstairs um, that minimize uh, the function in the interior. So it's a rather, yeah, it's not so beautiful, but I guess um, uh, we needed to put all these conditions into the uh, definition of weak solutions because um, only if we make these requirements, then we get a compactness theorem in the class of weak solutions, which allows us to, to, uh, to make these um, uh, limit arguments. And I did not write down all the technical solutions, all the technical, uh, there's just few conditions on the regularity of new um, upstairs as well. Okay, the main theorem, I'm running out of time. The main theorem then is that in, in any dimensions, I mean, I've mostly talked about dimension three, but this is existence part works in all dimensions. <clears throat> um, we can find, uh, 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 actually not in all dimensions, up to dimension six, I should, I should be honest here, up to dimension n, n, n equals six, um, because otherwise there's more um, 
singular sets, we haven't worked that out. So, so let, let's restrain this two dimension up to dimension six, but certainly in dimension three, um, we can uh, find uh, these weak solutions in a very general setting. Let me spend the first, last few minutes on telling you some of the properties. You may remember from inverse mean curvature flow that the solutions were outward minimizing area. It turns out that for these solutions, we can also formulate a quant quantity that is op outward optimized. And you take this quantity, <clears throat> you call it outward optimizing if um, this condition here holds. Um, in other words, you sort of take the area minus the um, bulk energy over the region covered by the surface. Uh, so it recovers the outward, um, outward uh, minimizing property of inverse mean curvature flow. But here you have to take into account a volume integral of this um, P nu. And with this quantity, uh, we get sort of the same um, property that um, we have uh, for inverse mean curvature flow and area. So in particular, we, if we have a weak solution of inverse space type mean curvature flow with an initial condition E0, um, such that the level sets uh, are pre-compact. So in other words, the surface doesn't jump to infinity immediately. Um, and uh, M is as I described it. Then the sub-level sets of U are all outward uh, optimizing in M with respect to the uh, normal vector field that we found in the weak solution. And um, uh, E t plus, this is uh, the um, set um, where u is less or equal than t. Um, the boundary of, yeah, there's a boundary sign missing, is outward optimizing in m for all t even for gre t greater or equal to zero. You see, at t equals zero, if the e zero, the initial set, is not outward optimizing, then the thing may jump. And of course, <clears throat> Uh, then the ET would not be outward optimizing, but after the jump, it is. And this can be uh, summarized in the sense that the set after the jump, this ET plus, is strictly outward optimizing. Um, there's one condition, it's strictly outward optimizing, in other words, you cannot further improve it, but then we have to assume, to, to make that statement, we have to assume that, that outside of ET plus, um, for larger T, there are no other jump regions. Um, and then we have this nice property that we can sort of um, see that the area after the jump is the old area plus the bulk energy term that I told you about. And finally, um, we have the monotonicity of area in mean curvature flow. The area was just exponentially increasing. Here, it is increasing at least as fast. You get that the time derivative of the bulk energy term is greater or equal than area. Um, so this includes, of course, a statement for inverse mean curvature flow. Unfortunately, we could not find a monotone quantity that would prove the Penrose inequality. So I, in that sense, the flow is not as good as we were hoping. We have, as you see, we have some monotonicity inequality, uh, but it is not quite, as, not quite good enough to give um, a Penrose inequality result. And uh, let me conclude with this slide. Um, if the initial surface is not outward minimizing, then the uh, surface will definitely jump. That's the first property. And secondly, if we have a mean curvature condition, if the initial mean curvature is strictly less than the true trace of the second fundamental form there, then it will jump 
and we find a generalized apparent horizon. So this is sort of the uh, most, most I can say in terms of application. In other words, the flow is good enough to jump to generalized apparent horizon. It can find an apparent horizon if your initial hypersurface is sort of far enough inside the three manifold um, and the mean curvature satisfies an inequality that forces it to jump. And then the result of the jump is a generalized apparent horizon. So this can be seen as an existence um, method to find such surfaces. And I want to con conclude with that. Thank you. Okay, that was uh, wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> so um, we have actually quite a bit of time, so that's, uh, that's great. So uh, Ryan, you your hand is up. Uh, yeah, so on this, this last result that you get C2 alpha generalized apparent horizons, how do you actually conclude the regularity of these? Because you only have a one-sided minimizing property. Well, when they, you see, um, because I have the strict inequality, I know that the uh, U surface must be um, on the other side of a jump region. So, mm -hmm. but in the jump region, uh, I can vary in both directions. So I get that H is equal to mod P, but mod P is um, in, let's see, mod P is, uh, in because the gradient is uh, ellipsoids, then mod p is in c zero alpha. So I can just use Schauder theory to to conclude, uh, you know, from the equation h equals mod p. I conclude that. Um, yeah, but, but how, so how do you know that you actually have a generalized mean curvature vector? Because are, are you if you're are you trying to apply like some version of uh, uh, Allard or something? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I sort of skipped over all the geometric measure theory that goes in. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so one, one uh, of the um, key technical things that has to be done is you have to take um, just like you do in the inverse mean curvature flow. You have to compute ddt of integral of h squared, something like that, or ddt integral of h minus h squared minus p squared. Yeah, and and do estimates, and then you get sort of a uniform bounds on um, first. You you already have a uniform bound on H, but on the right hand side, you get a negative term involving um, minus the gradient of the mean curvature squared. So this gives you on all the uh, level sets a. Um, on almost all the level sets, a relic Kondracho argument uh, convergence that, that H converges uh, strongly in L2. And uh, from that, you get a weak, first a weak mean curvature in L2 on all of the level sets. And then you can, um, in the jump region, you can then bootstrap up to see that you actually get a solution of the equation, equation H equals mod P. And okay. once you have a solution of H equals mod P, then you have C2 alpha estimates and um, that extends to the boundary and that's this boundary E0 plus. Right, so how do you know that when you're approaching the jump region, you don't drop mass? Is it, uh, it, oh, this is, I guess, is this the, this, this is where you use area monotonicity then? Yeah, the, yeah, that's not a problem. The mass is not gonna drop because of the- Yeah. Lower because, bounds on the, on right, the area. right, right, right. Okay, okay, thank you. There is a, a hand from uh, Christina. Hello, uh, I just was wondering, have you investigated the relationship between this um, mean curvature flow and the Jang equation? Yes, um, uh, in fact, that's an interesting aspect of it. I just didn't have time to include it. I, I, I wondered whether I'd include one or two slides. Yeah, maybe, maybe I go, um, Here's the, here's the equation. Um, I mean, this, when you look at this, it's very close to Jang's equation. Um, if you, 
look at uh, the term on the right hand side, gij minus d, this is almost exactly, you know, what you mm -hmm. see in, in Jenks equation. Somehow the, the key extra term, the difference to Jenks equation is the du squared term. That's the term that makes it so, sort of parabolic and pushes it, pushes the surface from inwards to outwards. And that also gives it a direction. You see in the Young's equation, when you solve Young's equation, then you get um, surfaces where H, you know, in, in, in the Shane Yao approach, they also have a regularization. The regularization is not like the epsilon here, they sort of put a capillary terms, a kappa u is somewhere in the equation mm -hmm. that makes for each positive kappa, the height of the surface is bounded above and below. And then as kappa tends to zero and they really solve the Young's equation, then some parts of the surface may go to plus infinity or to minus infinity. And the region where they blow up, the boundary is then a horizon which has either h equals plus p or h equals minus p. And here the effect as epsilon goes to zero is rather similar, but the gradient of u term um, makes sure that uh, the great, that um, it can only, that u can only go to plus infinity. And we may find surfaces where, uh, all I can say is that we find surfaces where h is equal to mod p. So, I cannot prove that it's either h equals plus p or h equals minus p. Huh. Now this dichotomy that you get in Young's equation, you don't get. Uh, I only get h equals mod p. Uh, you would have to find an extra argument to see whether uh, it's actually h equals plus p or h equals minus p. The, the positive thing, the extra thing we get is that we can go from inside to outside. Whereas the Young's equation sort of um, is is an ellipt it doesn't have this parabolic feature. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Christina. You you might want to take a look at the paper by Borney and Moore about uh, null mean curvature flow. It looks it looks also very similar like Jang's equation after you regularize. But Thank you. In in fact, the the the, the motivation for 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 that paper from Kristen Moore came exactly from, from studying Young's equation you know, and seeing how, mm -hmm. how can we make this parabolic. All right, there is a, there is a hand up uh, with Mutau. Oh, hi, Gerhard. Oh, very interesting talk. <laughs> just a quick Mutau, question. Hi. Yeah, um, could you just comment on how essential uh, this maximality condition on the initial data set is? You, you do a certain, uh, the, you only need it. You maximum. only need it for. You only need it for proving the lower bound on u. I, to okay. show that u that u epsilon is greater than greater than minus epsilon for that estimate, you need it. And you need an exact equation uh, of mass mass. I, 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 I need that equation. Um, <clears throat> I haven't studied with Marcus yet. It's an interesting point to see what happens if you, and this is, brings me back to Young's equation. If we don't make that requirement, then we don't yeah. get a lower bound on U. So we would sort of lose the property that U can be interpreted as a, um, a starting at time zero. You might then start at time minus infinity, but That's the- good boundary of the blow up region may still be a, um, a generalized apparent horizon. We haven't studied that yet. Okay. Um, so you, you definitely get something um, when you drop the uh, condition of uh, trace k equals zero, but you would have mm -hmm. to study what happens to the neg negative part of u epsilon as epsilon tends to zero. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you, yeah. Hi, yeah, this is Yao. Uh, great Hello. talk. Hi. So what happens to the Hawking mass? Uh, it's not uh, monotone, but is there any way to control the Hawking mass? Unfortunately, not. It's we we, we couldn't quite do it, and, and I mean there's some some consideration that a flow like this, which is not really in space time, but just place with p, 
um, cannot, th there has to be some extra ingredient because if it's a monotonicity, it would have to be sharp on Schwarzschild. So it would have to be so somehow what we're missing yet still is sort of the recognition property, whether the high, whether the initial data is a hypersurface in Schwarzschild or not. Because if there's a mon if there's a sharp monotonicity formula, it would have to be, it would have to hold with equality if this is, uh, these are yeah. some initial data inside Schwarzschild. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not exactly asking for monotonicity. So some slight modification of that. If you don't want an exact monotonicity, I think for data not too far away from from Schwarzschild, I think some you would get something. Yeah, but I haven't explored that. Well, I think it probably would be interesting. Some uh, something similar to monotonicity, not exactly the same. Right. It would be interesting to know whether this optimizing quantity, which of course is monotone, whether that has some physical interpretation, sort of this sum of area with a volume bulk term, whether you can sort of create a new monotone quantity if assembling the Hawking mass by incorporating this bulk term. But I'm not sure what the physical interpretation of this uh, bulk term would be. Well, here's quick talk first. Are there any other questions? All right, if not, uh, let's thank Christine again for a beautiful talk.